this is church. Uh, this is uh, this is wrestling. This is uh, where it all began. This is the gold standard still to this day. Oklahoma State's the number one wrestling program of all time in NCAA history. And when you go, you start comparing them to all the sports, UCLA basketball, whatever. Oklahoma State is still, Oklahoma State wrestling is still your gold standard. There is no other NCAA sports program in the country that has matched what Oklahoma State has done in wrestling. And it seems really sort of incomprehensible that a program could do what we've done here in wrestling with 34 NCAA titles. 100 years plus the success you've had, it's commitment. And when you think of a program that's maintained the level of success that Oklahoma State wrestling has maintained, uh, there's commitment around you. Excellence. It's expected, and people come here to compete with the best, uh, and they want to be the best. This, it, it's a standard of excellence uh, that I don't think anyone can really match. The Oklahoma State started really becoming the superpower in wrestling early on, so it began with great coaches, and then it's the chicken and the egg, I guess, or whatever, but once Oklahoma State established itself as the premier wrestling program in America, and then all the guys who are really difference makers out there and they want to be the best. Well, a lot of times that leads you to be, you know, to go to the best program. Oklahoma State's been able to not only get the top wrestlers in, but to elevate the other guys to that standard a lot of times, and which is why they consistently have been among the best wrestling programs still in America. Growing up in Oklahoma, you know, if you're a wrestler, it's the biggest place that you want to go to and as a young kid wanting to walk out there with an orange singlet on was something that I dreamed of doing. Being able to do that was very special. But for me it was like man I want to be a part of a program that's going to have a historic sense and a legacy you know forever and um, I mean we go on that you look on that wall you see those NCAA champs and like these are like dudes that like are remembered forever I mean it's so historic it's so special I mean 34 team titles I mean it's unheard of. Uh, yeah I was I've been a fan of Oklahoma State wrestling since you know, like since I can remember, my my dad he wrestled here, and my uncle also wrestled here. So I've been coming to Oklahoma State wrestling duels, you know, since I was in diapers really. And you know, it's it's been awesome. You know, I I, I can remember sitting up in in these seats and you know just picturing myself running out and you know competing in, in Gallagher and you know to get that opportunity to do that every year, it's it's really special. Again, Oklahoma State, they, you have that. There's just a different expectation. You walk in that orange singlet at a national tournament, everybody knows there's Oklahoma State, and he's expected to win because he is an Oklahoma State Cowboy. So, the yeah, others a tremendous pressure, but the pressure, if you're a Cowboy and you're in that orange singlet, there's just automatically an expectation that comes along with that that you don't get at every school. This program has produced people that go beyond the sport of wrestling and have extraordinary success in other walks of life. And I think that's the value of uh, such an outstanding program, is that it produces champions for life. Ed Gallagher, you, you think of the father of intercollegiate wrestling, you know. Ed Gallagher's impact on this program is still felt. You know, you, you often see the legacy of people kind of fade away and somebody, you know, take it over. Um, but there's something about Ed Gallagher um, that you can never let that legacy fail. Well, Ed Gallagher is pretty much considered the father of amateur wrestling. I mean, he goes along with, uh, you're talking about Abner Doubleday in baseball or uh, uh, Na Naismith in uh, basketball, those, those guys who were at the forefront of these sports evolving into what they became. He's the architect, he is the uh, grandfather, he is the, again, the man that uh, really, the sport really began and prospered uh, through Ed Gallagher. So while he was in college, he had played played football. He was a quarterback on the football team. He ran track. He had been an all-around athlete. He never wrestled. He was a great athlete, uh, track, football. Uh, he became an athletic director here at Oklahoma State. And but he he had dabbled in wrestling. He had uh, it had taken got his interest, 
and probably because he was an electrical engineering major and he was able to apply the principles and fundamentals of, of leverage to technical skills and he found a niche that he really enjoyed and then he was good at teaching it. He was exposed to physics and he was always intrigued by um, uh, the concepts of, of leverage uh, and momentum and motion. Uh, Newton's laws of, of, of motion uh, intrigued him and so he, he used that as, as a foundation that in look and study about uh, human physiology, muscle and bone, um, ligament structure, how, 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 how the body moves. And then there was a next logical step to psychology. He examined motivations, what motivated individuals, uh, what motivated teams. He began with electrical engineering and mechanical engineering but he kept, he kept studying uh, you know, the various things that might impact um, uh, an athlete. He looked at diet and conditioning. He even looked at the Chinese martial arts, especially those that kind of used an opponent's momentum against them. Uh, and so he would always examine any possible uh, avenue uh, to provide uh, a little advantage for, for his wrestlers. He was a student of the game. I think a big part of it came from just a great competitor, like I want to be better than the guy across the mat from me. I want my kids to be better. So maybe it's not just, you know, the moves, but it's how in shape you are. He wanted his kids to be tougher. They're in better shape. I, my kids are tougher. If it comes down to the third period or, you know, whatever, my, uh, my guys are going to win. So I think the main thing he had, as long again, he, he invented a lot of, or a lot of things, uh, again, came to fruition under him that we even see to the, in the sport today. But I think the fact that he drove his guys to be the toughest and the best was more of an attitude as much as anything that was developed here under him at Oklahoma State and has carried on throughout the years. He loved competition. Uh, his wrestlers loved him. Uh, he was a student of the game his whole life. Uh, it was just, it was just the, the perfect uh, storm of, of, of positive uh, reinforcement and support. It was just, I don't, I don't know how to describe it, but his coaching in, in wrestling was miraculous. I mean, considering over 23 season, his teams win 94% of the time. It's, it's, it's just unheralded. I would claim he was the best coach ever in any sport. But he knew that we all loved him. He made us wrestle better than we could. He gave us confidence, of course, and, uh, and you just couldn't lose. I think the only match I lost, uh, I just ran out of gas and he pinned me. So next Monday, Coach Gow said, Joe, he said, I'm not going to wrestle this week. I'm going to let this other boy wrestle. I said, I want you to come way in, in case you can't play quite. Keep our opponents guessing they don't know who's going to wrestle. When we got up there, I said, okay, Joe, you're going to wrestle. Okay, after that, I, I didn't have that nervous problem anymore. But they always made you think you were supposed to win. When you won, like, you just pat you on the shoulder and win the same race. The beginning about 1932, 33, uh, signs of, of Parkinson's began to show up. And so he had a, a palsy, a shaking that developed in his hands. And, and uh, through the years, it just, it slowly got worse. During the last several years of his life, his hands shook so much that he would sit on them at the, at, during a mass to keep them quiet. His voice was barely audible, but when he spoke, we listened very carefully because he was a magician, that's what he said to us. And so he heads off for a, a kind of a fishing trip in Colorado in, in 1940, uh, in that summer, um, and ultimately gets pneumonia and, and, and then passes away one week before his, his 53rd birthday. Um, it wasn't unexpected. People knew he was really, he was really suffering uh, by that point, um, and so it wasn't a surprise. Um, but, you know, they have a funeral service that it takes place at, at Gadler Hall. Uh, there are thousands of people there, uh, hundreds of his former wrestlers and, and, and their students, you know, come to attend. Um, you know, I think there was a great feeling of loss 
Um, but there was also this, this feeling of uh, wonder that they had had him, um, that he had been a part of their lives. And so uh, there, was a real, uh, there was a real special bond that had been created. And they knew uh, you know, that his influence would live on. Uh, so it was, it, it was, a, uh, it was really a, a celebration of his life. So Art Griffith uh, takes over. Art uh, is also a gentleman who didn't wrestle uh, when he was younger. Uh, he had helped when he was a senior though, he had been kind of an assistant coach for Ed Gallagher. Uh, he'd worked with, uh, Art, Art Griffith had worked with the freshman um, who couldn't wrestle competitively yet. Um, so uh, then Art leaves and he ends up uh, being a very successful high school coach in Tulsa. So what Coach Griffith did for Coach Gallagher, Coach Griffith sent his best wrestlers to Oklahoma State. And it made a difference for Coach Gallagher and his championships. And it was a real easy choice following Coach Gallagher's retirement of who we needed and who we wanted. Oklahoma State, again, had already kind of emerged as the powerhouse in collegiate wrestling. And give him credit for coming in and building on that. But he advanced the sport, again, training measures and and moves and technique and all those things that he advanced the sport here at Oklahoma State. When you talk about somebody that's technically was one of the soundest coaches, uh, brilliant in, in, in styles of wrestling, think of Gallagher as a guy that was focused on, okay, here's the moves that we need to learn, these techniques that we need to learn. Griffith was about style. What kind of style are you going to wrestle? Are you going to wrestle an aggressive, motion-oriented style where you're moving your feet all the time? Yes, Coach Gallagher was a leader in the education of the sport of wrestling. He categorized all these skills that he helped invent and develop uh, into takedowns, counters, escapes, reversals. Then along came Art Griffith, whose philosophy was let's tr apply more motion and sequence all these skills that Gallagher had invented and put them into a more fluid wrestling style, which is what Griffith had mastered and applied it to the individuals he was recruiting. So the Cowboys were continued recruiting success, no doubt, and bringing in the best of the best. And then again, coaching the other guys up to that level. Art Griffith, he's the guy that carried the torch and not only carried the torch, but brought the level up just a little bit more while he was there. Of the first 13 NCAA wrestling tournaments, OAMC under Ed Gallagher win 11 of the 13 and the other two, they come in second. By the time uh, Art Griffith comes along, we're winning over 80% of the NCAA tournaments in wrestling. Art Griffith takes over, and in his 13 seasons, they win eight more NCAA tournaments. And so, between Art Griffith and Ed Gallagher, they have won 19 of the first 26 NCAA tournaments. I mean, he just continues the success rate. And just think, those, those two men uh, still, Griffith and Gallagher, comprise 56% of our NCAA wrestling titles. Certainly the fundamental foundations of the Oklahoma State wrestling program starts with Gallagher and Griffith. And then came along one of Griffith's star pupils, Myron Roderick, three-time NCAA champion, who succeeded him. I think Coach Griffith handpicked Myron Roderick, you know, at, at that time. And Myron was coming off of the Olympics, uh, and then just 
there was a, a level of fire in Myron that was unbelievable. You know, some people liked it, some didn't, you know. He happened to be the youngest coach in NCAA history to take on a head coaching job, and he also became the youngest coach to win a national championship at age 23. And uh, so he didn't have any coaching experience when he took over, but he was a dynamic personality and he could recruit because wrestling had grown uh, across the country in the 60s. By the time he was uh, midway through his career, wrestling had grown from coast to coast. Myron's time was a competitive time and, and he, had a, he had a level of, of understanding with recruiting of what we had to do. It's probably the first time a coach really stepped outside of Oklahoma and went and recruited not just uh, nationwide, but worldwide. And not only did he go outside the state, he went outside the country to get a few Japanese wrestlers that would become national champions. You had the Hata brothers, Masaka and Tadaki Hata, but then you had Yojiro Yutaki, who became the a three-time NCAA champion that went undefeated in college wrestling and uh, uh, is claimed to be one of the, the greatest collegiate wrestlers of, of all time. That was the uh, heyday of getting those kids from Japan to come over. When you talk about some of the best, the very best to ever wrestle at Oklahoma State, well then you got Yutaki and Fujita and those guys who were next level superstars. Yohiro Yutaki is the gold standard and a gold medalist from Japan in the Olympic Games and all of that. So he is very celebrated. It helped change this campus and they took those wrestlers in with great respect and showed them great respect as student athletes and uh, as a result you know they had a wonderful experience here they would tell you that to this day uh, i think that's the uh, legacy of that but i also believe that they were the first the very first foreign student athletes to win individual ncaa championships in the united states that's a and here they did it at oklahoma state university that says a lot about the university and uh, Stillwater and uh, its history with diversity. But I think that Myron really had a vision and saw where wrestling was really developing and that we couldn't just do it with kids from the state of Oklahoma. It made a big difference in, in us remaining uh, on top and, and competitive in, at the NCAA level. And then when Myron decided he was good, it's time for him again, he retired as a young man as far as his wrestling coaching career, but he kind of handpicks and I'm getting ready to leave and here's the guy that we need to bring in. Following Roderick, you had Tommy Chesbro, who wrestled for Myron. He wasn't a great wrestler, but he was an outstanding coach and an outstanding student of the sport. He could teach from skills from virtually every position. Well, he was a brilliant coach, maybe our, our greatest coach when it comes to skill and technique. I mean, of course, we, we saw wrestling evolve from Coach Gallagher all the way up to this point of Tommy Chesbro. Tommy was brilliant when it came to technique. I mean brilliant, had such an influence. The one coach that I, if somebody asked me who influenced you more than anyone, it would have been Tommy Chesbro. Oklahoma State in those days was known for being very technically sound. Tommy continued that tradition. He also expected a certain precision in that technique. He wanted kids performing good, solid, sound technique the way he taught it. This guy was brilliant, and he could take just about anyone and develop a level of skill with them and put them on the mat, and they could win for Oklahoma State. Tommy Chesbro was brought in and won a national title in 71, I believe, but he never won another one. He was one of the most successful coaches ever 
And Oklahoma State was in the conversation every year. Probably should have won two or three national titles, but it didn't happen. He was a really, really phenomenal coach. He had athletes prepared to compete. He was just unfortunate in that he came up against a coach who was thinking, teaching, coaching wrestling 24 hours a day. And Tommy thought there was more to life than wrestling 24 hours a day. His only problem was that he ran into a dynamic force that hit the sport of wrestling by the name of Dan Gable. Tommy had won a national championship shortly after he had taken over the position as head coach of wrestling. Coach Chesbro's uh, lack of ability to win national championships beyond those first few years was a result of really Dan Gable. I, I don't know how to put it any other way. The guy was a master at getting them ready and peaking them for the NCAA championship. And for the next 15 years, he dominated the sport of wrestling. So as a result, the, the negative naysayers would say Tommy couldn't get them ready. Dan Gable was a coach who literally thought about it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He was one whose impact on his athletes was such that he really got into their heads and made them believe in everything he did. He started as head coach um, in the 76 season, five, six years after Coach Chesbro started, and immediately had an impact on the sport. Coach Chesbro's last two years, we were undefeated in duels, but at the tournament, were unsuccessful in, in getting past Gable because of the way he had his, his athletes prepared. Myron Roderick came in as athletic director, actually uh, in 83, 84, 1984. He removed Tommy from the position of head coach uh, because he wanted to be number one. He wanted the program to be number one. The thing about Myron is that he was extremely competitive, the, the competitor supreme. And you know, had a reputation for doing whatever it took to win. And so he had a great expectation that Coach Chesbro would do the same. And so, you know, if you can imagine coming into a position where your immediate predecessor is always around, looking over your shoulder, critiquing what you do, and then you, you couple that with the emergence of Dan Gable and the University of Iowa and, and their philosophy and their you know, drive to win. And it, it really put Coach Chesbro in a hard position. And then to have your immediate predecessor named the athletic director, you know that there's, that there's pressure on you. You've just finished an undefeated season finish second in the nation, and you go into the next season and know that that may not be good enough. Well, it was, it was tough. It was emotional for a lot of people, you know, that we saw Coach Chesbro uh, get fired after um, going undefeated that season and taking second in the NCAA championship. Um, wasn't good. You know, it wasn't a good move, bad move, bad decisions. The reaction from the rest of the country was, you know, this is wild. This is a great coach and you're letting him go. But because of that strong history, you know, at that point we had, had won, what, 28 national championships? But we hadn't won one since Chesbro's first year of coaching. It really, um, in so many ways seems unfair to Coach Chesbro, but it was just a product of what, what was the monster, um, the behemoth that Oklahoma State had created in wrestling. He was a victim of the program's overall success. After Coach Chesbro uh, was fired by Coach Roderick as the athletic director, he hired Joe C. C came from Cal State Bakersfield where he had won Division II national championships. 
He came with an appreciation and understanding of the motion philosophy in chain wrestling. He brought the program back to winning a couple NCAA titles. Now, Joe C. was the first coach brought into Oklahoma State who was not an Oklahoma State graduate. So that in itself was somewhat eye-opening for our fan base and a little bit controversial in the beginning. He did what Myron hired him to do, which was to bring Oklahoma State wrestling back to prominence. You know, we won two NCAA titles under Joe C. But Joe was very different from Coach Chesbro in that he was a very individualistic coach. He catered to individual needs. He let wrestlers wrestle their technique and, and helped coach them to make that technique better. He really tried to make uh, things better for the student athlete. And he went beyond uh, the benefits that were allowed, not in a major way, in a minor way. Joe was much more sort of laid back, California, go with the flow, and it got him in trouble. He was reported to the NCAA for violations. None of those violations were things that, that would have gotten him in huge trouble. You know, it would have been a slap on the wrist. But what had happened was the NCAA came and investigated those benefits and uh, he covered it up. And that's uh, the worst thing you could do. And that cost him his job. And he himself um, lied to the NCAA. And of course, that's the cardinal sin. You know, NCAA is not going to tolerate anybody not telling the truth. And there's some controversy there. Of course, OSU went on probation at one point and uh, almost got the death penalty because of things they were doing. But it was a whole laundry list of violations. Not any one thing that was just devastatingly bad, but just so many uh, rules that were broken that the NCAA again came down hard on Oklahoma State because they'd had some issues in other sports. So anyway, when wrestling got hammered, they hammered them and almost gave them the death penalty. I'll say this, uh, it wasn't easy for Coach C. Yeah, it wasn't easy. Um, carrying, a, uh, uh, carrying the tradition, um, the, a, le a level of expectation. Um, you know, can you imagine the expectation if your coach gets fired and went undefeated and took second in the nation? I mean, what am I supposed to do, <laughs> you know? Um, and he struggled there, you know. We, we didn't have some of our teams that, uh, uh, early on that they thought we were going to have, you know, we struggled finishing, you know, um, in the top five at times, you know, uh, but uh, he came through that and, and won championships and um, influenced a lot of us, made a big difference in a lot of our careers. During Josie's career, he produced the first African-American gold medalist in the world, Kenny Monday, who was an alumni of the Oklahoma State Wrestling Program. You had John Smith, who is the only wrestler to have won two Olympic gold medals at that time in the sport and four consecutive world medals. You know, that was during the C era. Oklahoma State turned to uh, what was considered one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, John Smith, an alumnus, to carry on the program and a novice coach who had to retire from wrestling to assume the duties of head wrestling coach at Oklahoma State. I was in my last year of competition in 1992-93 season and I'm, I'm trying to finish my career on top as a wrestler. I had to make a decision, am I going to throw this on top of myself and try to win an Olympic gold medal? It was an incredibly difficult year for John. John's older brother is Leroy Smith. At the time, he was the national coach, and so he was working with John. You know, he's like, John, what are you thinking here? Well, John felt a tremendous amount of loyalty to Oklahoma State. I've been in Stillwater since I was 10 years old, nine years old. This may be more important than winning the Olympic gold medal. And that's the only reason why I did it, was it was just like, this program needs me now, when my whole life I needed it. You know, he was, he was struggling with giving up his independence and his career. We had some conversations, but 
you know, he just felt it was the right thing to do and he didn't want to leave Stillwater. He loves it here. You just kind of take over that responsibility if it's important enough to you. And it was important enough to me. Was it the right thing to do for my wrestling? No. I struggled. I struggled. Um, but I appreciate those struggles because I did go on and win, you know. But I found out that I was a lot tougher than I ever thought I was. It was a tremendous um, stressor for him. Leroy kept telling him, John, you're not training enough. You need to get to some of these competitions. And John is like, but I can't. You know, I have 40 kids I'm responsible for. I got to get them to class. I got to help them make their grades. I got to get prepare them for competition. And it really impacted his training going into the 1992 Olympic trials. So it was a tremendous sacrifice that John made to his own goals for the good of Oklahoma State. When John assumed the position here at Oklahoma State and as he was trying to finish his Olympic career in Barcelona, Spain at the 92 Olympic Games, that leading up to that, you know, he had a very, the biggest challenge was going to be the trials. Here John comes into the trials. He hasn't had much competition. His training schedule had, has been disrupted. His routine that he'd had for five years, you know, that had brought him five gold medals was completely disrupted. And he comes in to wrestle John Fisher and Fisher beats him in the first match. Yeah, talk about a blow. And then here's Leroy, who's the national coach, who can't do anything to help him because he can't show any favoritism. And so John had to, to go and regroup and just dig deep and, and gather that courage and that strength to come back and beat Fisher to even make the U.S. Olympic team. I jumped right into the head coaching position and uh, had a losing ear. <laughs> so, you know, you can only think, you know, um, can I do this? Uh, you got student athletes, listen, we're gonna have a season and we're not gonna get to wrestle in the big eight and we're not gonna get to wrestle at the NCAA championships. And we had our first losing season since 1916 when we went 0-1. Am I good enough to, do, I mean, I may be a good wrestler, but can I be a good coach, you know? And, uh, it's the first time you, you start questioning yourself, and that year I had, I questioned myself a lot. So they redshirted everybody they could possibly redshirt and just wrote that year off. And then John Smith, the next year, able to bring those guys out of redshirt. They brought in two or three new recruits. You know, really, there was some young student athletes that had a lot of choices to make whether they stayed at Oklahoma State or whether they moved on. The real hero after all that mess was Alan Freed. A kid that was a senior in college was the best wrestler in the nation at his weight and he didn't leave. He gave up a year, his junior year, to stay with us and wrestle the seniors. I and mean, he could have went anywhere. You know, instead he gave up a year to help us piece our program back together. I try to lead by example. I don't try to get in people's faces and tell them what to do. I, I want them to maybe, if they want to, they can take notice of me and, and learn something from me if, 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 if uh, they'd like to. But if they don't, then fine. And if they want help, I'm, I'll always give it to them. And the next thing you know, OSU's won a national championship that year. So uh, kind of the, their first year back as a full strength squad under John Smith, OSU wins a national title. So that's what everybody's able to step back and go, okay, things are gonna be okay. And you know, it goes back to just, you know, walking in the gym, you know, looking at the banners every day. Your your facility's named after maybe one of the greatest coaches in any sport, you know, and he was a wrestling coach. You know, I, I think as a student athlete, when you come to Oklahoma State for wrestling, there's a level of legacy that just rubs off on you that never leaves you. It's bigger than your performances. It's bigger than what you did. You're, you're just a part of a program, you know. You begin to understand that this program can help me win. 
It can help me go to levels that maybe I couldn't do at other schools. You just get to look around on walls and stuff. It makes it a real belief system that it can happen. And I think for that reason, the legacy and the traditions of what we have, it rubs off on you. Oklahoma State, again, has had their share of so many national champions, superstar wrestlers, but if you talk about one family, there's no doubt that the Smith family, even in the state of Oklahoma, might be your number one wrestling family. Wrestling is the family business, and Oklahoma State wrestling is the family business. The Smiths are sort of synonymous with Oklahoma State wrestling, uh, but there's a pretty good reason for that. It's just the, the amount of time and effort and um, accomplishment that has gone into the program. Well, a lot call us, uh, a lot of people like to refer to us as the, the first family of wrestling, but we grew up in an Oklahoma University sport fan, primarily through football. We were only 20 minutes from Norman. We'd watch OU wrestling. That was my scope of what was going on in the state until about my junior, senior year in high school when Oklahoma State came knocking. And you know, when Leroy made the decision to come to Oklahoma State back in 1976. He was recruited by Iowa, he was recruited by University of Oklahoma. He made the decision to come to Oklahoma State because Oklahoma State was the best. They had the history and wrestling on the Oklahoma State University campus was the best sport on campus. But once, uh, once I came here and once I realized what uh, the sport was all about and who had been here and what they had achieved and what they stood for, you know, won me over. That association started just a natural progression. Since that day, literally none of the family, at least in that generation, thought of going anywhere but Oklahoma State. With four wrestlers wrestling for Oklahoma State, they're the only three brothers to ever each win a national championship. The fourth brother was a three-time All-American. It's natural that people associate the Smiths dating from 1976 to 2021 with Oklahoma State wrestling. It, just the impact has been that strong. Our family and our development can be linked to this great passion and support uh, that we had. We stood and we tried to represent the very best. We wanted to be the best. Our parents instilled that aspiration, that desire to do what you want and give it all you've got and be your best. So that was instilled in us at a very young age. And then the work ethic that not only my parents exhibited, but that drove us. You know, if we're gonna be good, we've gotta work hard. We had a lot of fun with training and challenging ourselves. And so it was, uh, yes, it was competitive, but it was aspirational. And we kept the dream alive. Uh, obviously, everything started with Leroy, who came to Oklahoma State, had a choice at one time. All I can ever think about is, thank God, you know, he made the right choice for all of us, because it was the right choice for all of us. It ended up being our home. It ended up being something um, bigger than just wrestling to us. Um, and, you know, those are the things that you hope you get from a university, from an athletic department. It's something bigger than your, actually your sport. And, and uh, I think Leroy choosing Oklahoma State, uh, we're, we're real lucky that, that he went against all of us. Through my brothers, um, Mark, Pat, myself, and Leroy, we've had a lot of accomplishments in college. You know, you think of my youngest brother, he was a three-time All-American, you know, and sometimes you think, you know, wow, three-time All-American. But then you got Pat, who is a few years older than Mark, was the first four-time national champion. 
you know, something that had never been done since the beginning of the NCAA championships in 1928 in wrestling uh, became the first. You know, it seemed like it was almost impossible to do. Pat's experience with that was challenging. It was intense. It was emotional. But I'll just say this, uh, might have been the toughest wrestler I ever coached. I fortunately got to coach him as the head, his head coach that year, and it was a great experience for me. And, and I, had, I had won two national titles here and was a four-time world champion, a two-time Olympic champion. I still consider his four national championships as one of my greatest moments in the sport. It, it, uh, can I say it was bigger than standing on the platform and seeing your flag go up during the Olympics, you know, yeah, I think I can. I think the excitement of helping someone else accomplish a, a moment in time that, that never had happened was incredible feeling. Albert James Ferrari Jr. He is one of one to be certain, both in life and on the collegiate level, as he wins a national title at 197 pounds. Rare air for a true freshman. With AJ Ferrari for us, it was it was a matter of him just loving this it here, you know that. He came in and, and he embraced, you know, what we begged him to do. I mean, it was awesome. It was great. Just so much, um, so much work that I had done to get there, and then to win it is just—it's just crazy, you know. So much work that my parents had, the sacrifice they made, paying off my family, and then my school. You know, I just—I love the school. I love my teammates. You know, they're my brothers. So it's just great to put the whole team on my back and then, you know, do it. You know, I talk. Big talk, as my coach says, you know, but I back it up, so I work, I work really hard. You know, it's nice to, to, to see your student athletes really mature at a level, not just on the mat, but off the mat, because when you get them to mature off the mat, it's so much easier to help them win. And that's what AJ did for us. He, he matured a lot off the mat and, and allowed us to take him to a level as a true freshman that was incredible. Growing up, I had watched a lot of Coach Smith, just a big model for me, you know, just in everything. And it was just great to to watch him and just see the way that he um, he changed the sport. And, you know, I want to be just like him, you know, change the sport in my own way, just like him, you know. So it's just, it's crazy to be a part of such a great historic program. Well, when you think of the future of Oklahoma State Wrestling, you think of, uh, hey, when are we going to win again? You know, I mean, that's something that's, on my mind every day. It'd mean everything to me. You know, I, the first national tournament that I can watch was the last, in 2006, whenever we, we won, Oklahoma State won our last national title. So to be on the team that brings a national title back to Oklahoma State, it would it'd mean everything to me. And, you know, that's, that was one of my goals that I wanted to, uh, to do whenever I was deciding where I wanted to go to school. You know, I wanted to not only, you know, compete for national titles for myself, but I wanted to be on a team that that I knew was going to be able to compete. Man, I mean, it's to get number 35 to me, it, it's, I mean, I can't even describe it. I mean, it's just so much. It's just like everything that we live for, you know? I mean, it's the stuff that we know we dream about. We go to sleep at night and we're thinking about it. It'd be amazing to see that happen, and, and it will happen soon. I know uh, the work ethic that these guys have and, and the dedication off the mat that they're, they're willing to show, and um, I'm really excited for that number 35 to come into play. This is a program of winning and they're going to continue to do that. The future here is just, it's so great and it's just so open for, um, for greatness and I mean, honestly, just I'd say what we can do is limitless, you know, I'd say our potential. It's just, it's just crazy just to be a part of that and just to add to that legacy is just great and to win number 35, man, it would, it means everything to me, just put it that way.